conversations. My guest today is someone who I treasure immensely, and I don't know what I'm going to talk to her about because I love her so much, I have a feeling that whatever we talk about will work. This is Katie Dickinson. Um, Hi. Longtime friend. She's helped me out on any number of occasions. Um, and yet, we've never been to each other's houses. We're not that kind of friends. I, there's something about you that I admire and respect. And, and it's just nice to know that that value is out there in the world. Do you feel? Thanks. <laughs> the feeling's mutual. I <laughs> really like you. Uh, strangely enough, I was not going to talk about real estate. But as we started the show, you started talking about real estate. And uh, it seemed like a nice intro. Uh -huh. You're the lesbian real estate agent of Missoula. Yes, I am. And uh, let's talk real estate. Tell me what was going on that you were talking about before we began. Okay, well, the real estate market right now is very active. There's not a lot of inventory out there. And uh, so what's happening, what that means is that there's a lot of buyers waiting in line for the more houses to be on the market. and. Um, so when a house comes up, I listed a house last week. It was a small house, two bedroom, one bath house over on the old west side. And I uh, got two overpriced offers in the first day that it came out on the market. So that's what's happening right now. It's unfortunate for buyers, especially in the lower price range, because there isn't much out there, um, especially that's worth anything. A lot of FHA buyers, which means there's certain standards that the house has to fit within for FHA buyers to um, be able to qualify for a loan. The roof has to have at least five years life on it. The electricity's got to be at least 100 amp service. And there's all these um, requirements that FHA requires. And there's not a lot out there. And so the competition is pretty stiff right now. And then, of course, the housing market keeps increasing in price. So it's tough. So Missoula is a place that people want to come to? Yes, and also there's a lot of people in the rental market that are wanting to buy because they're tired of renting. You know, people that are renting, how I always look at it is you're just buying a, a house for somebody else if you're renting. You know, you're paying somebody else's mortgage payments, and people are realizing that. And rents are going up. The rental market is really increasing a lot. So instead of paying eight, nine hundred dollars a month in rent, people are able to save up a little money. There's a lot of grant money right now on the north side and the west side. The Human Resource Council, as well as the Northside Grant Assistance Program, ha have all these programs where um, they have assistance for lower income people. And so that's partly what's happening. So I think renters are getting into the real estate market, as well as there's people moving here from out of town. There's people moving up um, that maybe have more people in their family or for some reason want a bigger house, or people moving to a smaller house, or Lots, lots of changes. So there's a lot of different ways people are making changes and in getting into the real estate market. I didn't think we'd talk about real estate at all. I was going to ask you penetrating questions about your honesty. OK, we can do that. Let, let's go to that honesty thing. There's something about you that just, when I first met you, just blew me away was that you were as honest as I try to be, that you were there. And it wasn't a question of, oh, I'm liberated and I'm gay. It's just a question of who I am has to show. When did that start forming for you? Do you remember a time when you sort of said, this is who I am and, I and I can't hide it? I think that I've always just been who I am and can't hide it from when I was growing up. It's just. I think that just comes from my mom, who was a totally open and honest person and taught me to be that way as well as a kid, as a teenager, and then when I came out when I was in my early 20s. And just, it was an easy transition for me. I was in living in the Santa Cruz Mountains in California. And when I discovered that, in fact, I was a lesbian, that it was just a real easy transition for me to make. And I've just been out since. I've never had a period where I was in the closet. And I've always just been able to be out, be real open, be real honest in what I do and the kind of jobs that I do. 
I won't work in a place that it doesn't accept me for who I am. And uh, it's just, I think it's just always been there for me. I know I've written about you and I've, I've done all kinds of things with you. So I know some of the answers you're going to tell me. Let's talk about some of those jobs before you became a real estate agent. Okay. The uh, welder? Yeah, I lived in Seattle for a year. And when I was in Seattle, I, I um, took a um, training class a, um, in welding at a place called SOIC, which is uh, Seattle Opportunity Industrial Center, where they had non-traditional work for women as well as, you know, for just people getting into the trades. And so I took a welding class, and then I worked for a place called Pacific Foundry. This is in 1974, and I built trains. I was a welder, and uh, working in a company with 3,000 men, and I was the only woman. And so that's how I started in non-traditional work. And then from there, I lived in, uh, I moved from Seattle over to the Olympic Peninsula and lived on a gay and lesbian commune and just sort of worked the farm for a while. We had a 78-acre farm over on the Elwha Peninsula, or the Olympic Peninsula on the Elwha River. And so I just worked the farm over there for about a year. And then I moved to Montana from there. And um, a carpenter, firefighter, welder. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was a firefighter. I worked for the Forest Service from 76, 77, I think, till 83. Tell me the story about the old guy who uh, you didn't think would like you. Or In the Forest Service? I believe that's the story. Um, I ha who, who turned out to be one of your staunch supporters. Right. That, that's the story I remember. Yeah, there's a guy that I used to work with, an old logger, old redneck guy, that uh, wonderful man. Um, but you know, about as redneck as you can get in a bitter it. And uh, he um, was the fire management officer, or the dispatcher, actually, at uh, Sula, where the district that I was working on when I was fighting fires. And there were a few lesbians working there at the time. There was a few women on the trail crew and on the timber crew and on the fire crew. And so the ranger of the station was getting flack from other districts saying, oh, you're harboring all these lesbians down there. You know, you can't be doing that. And uh, so it was a temporary job that I had, seasonal, permanent seasonal. Every year I'd get hired back again. And one spring they weren't going to hire me back. And my, my, bo my direct boss, um, this guy with, you know, just a flat top and logging pants, um, fought for me tooth and nail to get me back on there and um, you know defended me saying that it's not about who I sleep with it's about the kind of work that I do and I'm one of the best firefighters he has and so they're not going to fire me and so he stuck up for me I've had situations like that it's been it's been a challenge to be a woman and that has nothing to do with being a lesbian it, there's been a challenge to be a woman working in non-traditional jobs working, you know, being one of two women on a fire crew. And the reason that I was um, hired for that is because affirmative action kicked in and they had to hire 10 percent. Any government jobs had to hire 10 percent women. And um, so, you know, a 20 person crew, that's two women. So they were doing that then. So you've consciously sort of been on the cutting edge, deliberately. Yeah, well, I don't, sometimes. didn't want to be know, a secretary or a yeah, nurse. Sometimes. <laughs> Okay, you work for, and uh, this might be a commercial for them. Okay. Lambros Realty. Lambros Real Estate. Real Estate, yes. all right. You're one of their biggest sales people? I am. I'm one of the top five top producers. And in the city, you told me some figures? There's uh, changes because there's a lot of turnover in this industry. But I think there's around 400 agents right now in the Missoula Multiple Listing Service um, and the Missoula Association of Realtors, which includes the Bitterroot and Frenchtown and the under outlying areas. And um, but I'm one of the.
top producers in among those 400 agents as well as within Lambros. And you're a lesbian. I am. Yes. I'm proud of it. Does it stand in your way? No, not at all. It's Could an you be it's even, an asset. Even better if you were. I don't know. You were telling us how great you were as a lesbian. Could you be even better if you were straight? Oh well, I don't think being a lesbian or being a realtor has really much to do with one another. I am who I am, and um, and I I have I work with straight and gay people and I'm a good person and I think I'm a good realtor and it sort of doesn't matter that I'm a lesbian and it doesn't doesn't mean I would be better if I was straight or I'm better because I'm a lesbian it really makes no difference it's it's about who I am in my ethics and my honesty and in my knowledge of houses I was a carpenter for 12 years so I know houses really well so being able to go and look at houses and to be able to show houses to people with that knowledge I think is a real benefit and that sort of has nothing to do with my sexuality I don't think. I think I've got a niche market in the gay community and you know not that I've got every gay or lesbian person that's buying houses but um, I think I've got a pretty good niche market but I also work with a tremendous diverse group of people which includes straight and gay and lesbian people. You answered a very stupid question very well. <laughs> <laughs> when did this come up uh, with Lambros? There had to have been a point when you said, okay, if I'm going to work here, I have to be who I am. Was there a day or a time? Or Well, when I first interviewed for Lambros, I got my license first and then went, which is how you do it typically, is you get your license and, um, and then you find a broker to work for because you can't just hang your license anywhere without a broker. And um, so um, when I interviewed with Lambros at first, they didn't hire me. They, they s didn't give me a reason. I interviewed, I interviewed with, four, with, there's four owners at Lambros and a man managing broker. I interviewed with all of them, plus I, I interviewed with three individual agents and um, took all this time and did all this interviewing and thought I did a pretty good job, although I was, I think, too honest when I interviewed with Mr. Lambros. Um, because one of the questions he asked me, he says, so tell me, tell me about your strengths and tell me about your weaknesses, you know? And so I was talking about myself and he says, so tell me what makes you uncomfortable. And I said, businessmen in, I said, men in business suits with money. <laughs> who I was talking to was George Lambros, who owns um, Lambros and a lot of real estate in, my, in, in Missoula. And um, so I think partly I didn't get the job because of that. So then I interviewed, I talked to a couple agents that I started having a little rapport with and, and they talked me into coming back again for another second interview. So I went back again for a second interview, interviewed with the same people and um, once again didn't get hired. So I went to work for Missoula Realty for about three months, but it was a small company, there was no training. I, I like people, I like being in a big company, not so much corporation, I'm not a real corporate person, but um, I like having a lot of people around me, a lot of activity, I like being able to have the support system that Lambros has, and so I went back a third time and they put me on probation, first time they've ever put anybody on probation that has started working there. And uh, they gave me six months to make a minimum amount of production that, um, that they just set an arbitrary number to. And I think the reason I didn't get hired right away, I mean besides my honesty and besides maybe I didn't fit their mold, uh, mold of, a, um, of a typical realtor, you know, and uh, I think it was a class difference and things like that too, but I think it was also homophobia that was partially responsible for me not getting hired on right away. And um, so uh, the third time when I went in, they did hire me, they put me on probation, and the probationary period they gave me of six months, I beat their quotas in two months. and. So they've been happy with me ever since, and I've been out. I've been out since the get-go. You know, I told them who I was, not at the interview, but because it, it didn't matter, it didn't come up at the interview. But you know, from the get-go, the first 
holiday party that we had, I brought my girlfriend, and it was really obvious who she was to me. And, and so that's how I came out to them originally, is just by bringing Mona with me wherever I went. And then from there, you know, I just, you know, I advertised in Pride. My, one of my bosses, Bruno, who is on the AIDS Council Bruno also, Freya. Bruno Freya, yeah. um, he, when The Outspoken first came out, the very first issue, he had a copy of it that he had gotten a hold of and um, called me up to his office one day, said, Katie, I want to show you something. I've got to talk to you. So I went up to his office and he uh, threw the Outspoken across his desk and said, why aren't you advertising in this? And uh, I said, well, actually, I talked to Greg about that, about advertising in there, and, and uh, I'm planning on advertising in there. I just didn't know about the magazine prior to it coming out. So I've just been totally out in this job. I, was, I wasn't planning on telling these stories, but, but I will anyway. <clears throat> there was one morning I was sound asleep. The phone rings. Uh, we had just started outspoken. And, this is Katie Dickinson. Why aren't I advertising in your magazine? And uh, you advertised ever since. Ever since, yeah. Um, you have no trouble working with straight clients, do you? Oh, no. There's no, no problem. No, none whatsoever. <clears throat> I guess if there's any message I've always wanted to use you for is that if you're open, if you're honest, if you're out there, you can do your job and you can do it as well as anybody else. And, uh, I agree. You're someone who uh, typifies that completely for me. <clears throat> no. You and I are both unattached right now. Yes. How do you feel about that? This is the first time I've been single, actually, in about 20 years. And um, it's quite the adjustment for me. It's, um, but I'm making the adjustment, and it feels OK. It feels like I'm growing and learning and doing what I need to do as a single person right now. And I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of activities. I have a lot of community events. I'm involved with the lesbian chat group every Tuesday night at the community center. I sing with the Montana Women's Chorus. I take tap dancing lessons on Thursday nights. Um, I do a lot of, besides working, you know, I just keep myself busy. Part of that, I think, sometimes feels like, OK, I'm keeping too busy and sort of denying what it is that I need to work on or what I need to do to grow. But then, you know, I spend, I actually do spend a lot of time by myself and a lot of time in the woods with my dogs, taking my dogs for walks. And nature is really important to me. And um, so, you know, I think it feels like a healthy place for me to be right now. It's different. It's an adjustment. It's been since December that I've, and this is now middle of May. So it's been a little while, but not very long. <laughs> I'm new at it and learning. <laughs> I know when I was younger, I thought I had to have somebody. Yeah, me too. Once I had that first one that lasted six and a half years, then there had to be somebody, you know. Yeah, serial sequence. monogamy. Yeah. And uh, like you, I decided, well, maybe being alone and having wonderful friends isn't so bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> when I started Outspoken, one of the things I really wanted to do was to create a gay community in Missoula that involved men and women. Mm -hmm. I'd heard about other places where it was sort of segregated, and a monthly potluck was a strictly male affair. Um, I don't know if I've succeeded, but you, would you like to talk about that? Inherent, you know, we're we're both gay, but there is a sort of difference. And get me out of this, Katie. Say something. Well, I think f for most of my adult life, since I have been out, which was since I was about 21, and I will be 50 in two weeks. Um, but. Um, most of my friends, except for one really, really dear friend that I have in Sacramento, California, who is a guy, most of my friends, most of my circle of f 
friends have been women. And um, that was true in Seattle. That was true when I lived in the Bitterroot all those years. As far as the gay or lesbian community, I've worked with men being in non-traditional work all my life and have made straight men friends. But as far as being part of the community where men and women, gay men and women are, and lesbians are hanging out together, the last couple years is when I've done more of that. And that's part of what you have brought into my life, I think. Um, with Outspoken, with um, the Potlucks, with the, you know, the Gay and Straight Together organization. And so I've met a lot more gay men than I have Flowery, women yet. Uh, <laughs> and I like it. I like my gay men friends. And, and I feel like I have a lot of people right now in my life, men and women, that are important to me. And I appreciate that. I appreciate what you've done in the community. And because it, it feels like I've expanded my circle because of that, because of the organizations that that you've done. And I think other women have as well. I mean, there's still the lesbian chat group, you know, and there's the women's chorus and there's the men's chorus. And there's, you know, separation. Mm -hmm. I think we need that, you know. I and, do too, but I think there has but to I also, be yeah. this area where once in a while we come together I and agree. honor each other and realize also that for politics, if nothing else, is that putting those two forces together right. means that you've got a lot more people behind Right, right, and doing pride together, doing the pride yeah. events together, and and then just socializing together. You know, I wish there was a a place in Missoula that was comfortable for uh, us as a gay community to be able to do that. Besides the Amvets, you know, um, which is too smoky and dark and not very welcoming in my opinion. I've never seen you down there. From the thing I've been there a couple times, but not very often. You're a realtor. There are uh, rumors all the time that somebody's going to start a new gay bar that will be above ground and clean. And there's a rumor that there's a couple women in town, a couple young women that are looking to open something that possibly has a, um, probably going to be more like a tavern, just has a beer and wine license and above ground for women and men, and I don't know anything else about that yet. I talked to, oh, it's been about two years ago now, I talked to a couple men who were very interested. They almost bought when Sean Kelly's was yeah. available. They almost bought that perfect location, I think. I think that the, I think it's out there. I think that, you know, if they opened it, we'd come. It, because it's like just a place to go hang out with comfortably with friends because there's a lot of people that don't that want to be able to sit with their girlfriend and hold hands but aren't comfortable doing that at the hobnob and or dancing at the union club on Friday night with their girlfriend or their boyfriend you know and um, so I think if there was a place like that you know I mean we've got the community center and there's little events that happen there but as far as a public place to be able to do that I think I think it would go. So yeah, as a realtor, I should try to find somebody that's anybody looking for. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> I have found, and I think you probably have, is that if you're honest and let it all hang out, the people will accept you. That's been if, my experience. If they like you. I, I find, for instance, uh, a lot of gay people think that straights are against them. And I've found that if you present yourself to them, nine times out of 10, they'll fall over backwards to be kind right. and nice. And there's also a lot of, I think, a lot of people who think they're in the closet. But if they come out to somebody, there's, you know, the, you always hear the response, oh, hmm. I, I've known that for years. I've known that yeah, for years, yeah. you know. How come you didn't tell me years ago? Things like that. And, um, and I think. You know, the more of us that come out, the easier it is for all of us. And I think the reason that a lot of people don't come out is because they're afraid of rejection. But I don't, I don't think that that that's necessarily a reaction that most people would have. Now, teacher, there's teachers that might get fired. There's some people. I mean, there there aren't a lot of protections out there for us in a lot of in housing. We can still get discriminated against. Yeah. In jobs, we can still get, get discriminated against. I could lose my job. You know just because 
I'm a lesbian and if they wanted to, you know, and, and I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. But I haven't. In fact, I've been really supported there. And, um, and I think that would be the case for a lot of people. And I think the more of us that come out, the easier it is for everybody to do that and for more people to follow in their footsteps, I think. It's I'm going to go out on a limb here. Um, I would say most of the problems between gays and straights are, boy, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, have to do with our own fears. It isn't that the straight world is so against us, it's we assume that they are, and we're scared, and, and we have problems with accepting ourselves, and once we do that, mm -hmm. um, my feeling has been that I can't remember anybody putting me down for being gay in this town. Once I just mm -hmm. stood out there and said, okay, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, now I realize, well, you can't I realize people get hurt yeah. and, and, right. and I'm not typical, but uh, the generalization I'm trying to make is that by and large, if you come out, you'll be accepted. By and large, I agree. Um, you know, I mean, there's still you know, beatings that happen. There's been in our state. I mean, there's Matthew Shepard. There's, you know, that happens. And so it is a reality that we have to pay attention to. But, um, you know, in, in my experience, it's been, it's been a good experience to be out. I mean, the, you know, it's like not everybody's going to like you, but not everybody's going to, you can't, nobody, that's true in life. Not everybody's going to like you. Um, I think, in my experience in Missoula, even if I've been here since 74, um, you know, I've been more supported for being who I am as opposed to harassed for who I am. I mean, there's, there was one time I was walking down the street in Missoula, walking down Broadway and with my girlfriend, we're holding hands, and we weren't even holding hands, I don't think. We were just walking side by side on the sidewalk on Broadway and these two guys in a p big pickup truck, drive by and, and uh, rev their engine and yell out the window, hey, dykes! And we went, yeah! I mean, that's how we respond to it instead of getting freaked out by it or worried about it, you know? You just claim it. And, you know, I don't, I think that's okay for me to do and that's okay for you to do. And I think it's okay for whoever's comfortable in doing that right, to I'm do not. that, you know? And some people who aren't, that's okay for them too. I've got no judgments right, about uh, people that don't. For ourselves, let's put it that way. Right, but I think the straight community is, I mean, in my experience, very accepting of who we are for who we are. I, uh, I've had tremendous support from them. I just, one of the things as I got involved that blew me away was the number of straight people who are out there who see this as a civil rights cause. Mm -hmm. Uh, much as white people might have seen blacks mm -hmm. in the 60s. And uh, they're working, organizing pride uh, events, and, mm -hmm. and they're quiet. It's only a little bit later you find out that they're straight. Mm -hmm. They're there because they want to be, and they believe that uh, this is worth, mm -hmm. worth pursuing. And uh, boy, I, I have been really grateful to those people. Sure. Um, I think we've almost got down to the time. Okay. Um, Dad, I hate to let you go. If you could offer advice, this is one of those stupid questions I try never to ask. So he waits and asks. But I'm going to ask anyway. <laughs> if you had to give advice to somebody young um, who definitely felt they were gay, but what would your advice be? now, not as opposed to when you were a kid, but now? See, you hate those questions. I hate well, those yeah, questions. to just, I think, get support from peop like-minded people from, I mean, there's so many places to do that now. With those of us who are out, with the community centers, with, you know, different organizations where kids can reach out. I mean, in the high schools, there's the Gay and Straight Alliances, and there's GLSEN, and there's, you know, all these organizations that we didn't have when we were in high school. 
I mean, if you know, we were talking earlier about you thought you were the only one when you first came out. Yeah. You know, I didn't because I was in California in Santa Cruz, and it was probably a little later. Mm -hmm. But um, to just um, feel good about who you are and not feel and and get support from other people who also feel good about who you are as a person and um, you know talk to people about it I guess I think the message that I've always got from you and, and that I would like to stress is that you're all you've got yeah you know and do the best can't. you can it might be nice if you were something else or if you felt differently but you are who you are yeah and, and maybe don't make assumptions you know about that people aren't going to accept you for who you are, or that you're going to be hated for who you are. And maybe don't make assumptions either about that it's going to be easy to come out because it depends on where you are and who you are. But you know, to just do your best and kind of do your best. Don't make assumptions, you know. And and I don't know. I'm going to get you out of this cage. Okay. <laughs> you are one Thanks, of my Greg. favorite people. And I'm so I love glad you that you came on the show today. And it Thank seems you. like a bit of a love fest. It's for real. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it?